So in the 1960s, string theory gets its start. It, it's trying to explain the strong nuclear force and ends up not explaining the strong nuclear force. But there's something buried in the mathematics that had everyone like going like, hmm, and that was these extra dimensions. It turns out that if you want tiny sub microscopic strings to be your force carriers in the universe, they don't have enough wiggle room in just three dimensions. Like if you constrain them to be in three dimensions of space and one at a time, and you set them wiggling and you need their wiggles to be the properties of the forces that you see in the universe, there's not enough flexibility. They, they need to wiggle more. And in order to make the math work in this 1960s version of string theory, there needed to be 26 dimensions, 26 dimensions. That's what they needed. That was the room, the amount of room that these strings needed to actually do their stringy thing and for all the math to line up. Which is fine, I guess, if these dimensions are curled up on themselves. Now, skipping ahead a little bit, we would later find out that 26 dimensions wasn't right, that uh, it's more like 10 or possibly 11 dimensions. Don't worry, we'll get there. And these extra dimensions can't just be in any old configuration. And you, you might think, you might think like, okay, if I had some extra dimensions and they're curled up, there's just like one way for them to curl up and it's the end of the story. But it's not. It's not. Think of... Think of all the different ways you can you can curl up a piece of paper, right? You can take a piece of paper and you can roll it around to make a cylinder. There's one way. You can take a piece of paper and then you can rotate one end before you attach it. That's a Mobius strip. You can take a piece of paper and curl it this way and curl it this way to make a torus or a donut. When you make that donut, you can flip the dimensions and make something called a Klein bottle. So already right there, there's four ways of folding up, of curling up a two-dimensional piece of paper. So imagine a 26-dimensional piece of paper or a 10-dimensional piece of paper or a six-dimensional piece of paper that you're trying to curl up in all the possible ways. In order for string theory to work, there needs to be extra dimensions to our universe. There's our three macroscopic dimensions, our one dimension of time, and then either six or seven additional dimensions. And don't worry, like I said, we're going to get to that later of how many dimensions there might be. If we just take six dimensions, if we just stick to that, there's basically an infinity number of ways. Not Probably not strictly in infinite, but there's a lot. After some more mathematical digging, string theorists figured out that there, you can't just wrap these dimensions up in any old way. They do have to follow certain geometric rules, certain topological rules. And these fall under a general class of ideas called Kalabi-Yau manifolds, named after the two people that figured it out, the mathematicians. How many possible Kalabi-Yau manifolds could there be for these extra dimensions? somewhere around 10 to the 200,000. So, you know, a lot. And what makes this really interesting, why we care about the shape of these little compact dimensions, which kalabi -Yau manifold matters, because it matters. Because if you arrange the tiny curled up dimensions differently, that changes how the strings are going to vibrate and how the strings vibrate determines how they appear in our everyday world, what they look like, how their range, their masses, their spins, their electric charge is all determined by, by the vibration, but the vibration is determined by the geometry of the tiny curled up dimensions. Okay, so it should be pretty straightforward to ask, uh, I know that's a lot, 10 to the 200,000 different ways of combining these, so which one's our universe? The simple, straightforward approach, it'd be brutal, but it'd be, you know, you get the job done, is pick a structure, pick one of the Calabi-Yau manifolds, 
Stick some strings in it, see how they vibrate, see the different vibration patterns allowed by the strings, and see if that matches any of the particles in our everyday existence. We can't do that. We can't do that because we don't have a string theory. Even today, we don't have a string theory. We don't know how a particular choice of Kalabi Yao manifold will manifest in the vibrations of strings. We don't know how to pick them. We don't know which Kalabi Yao manifold corresponds to our universe. There can be one and only one that corresponds to our universe, but we don't know which one and we can't figure out how to calculate it because this was true in the 1960s and it's true today. We don't have a fully fleshed out string theory. We only have approximations, guesses of what we think and what we hope the actual string theory looks like. But in the approximations, the approximations aren't good enough to tell us how a particular choice of geometry and topology of the kalabi manifold affects the vibrations of the strings. How are we going to answer that? How are we going to respond to that? We'll get there in a few episodes, but now I want to go back in the next episode to talk about how string theory went from being just a theory, a failed theory of the strong nuclear force to a theory of everything. And that happened in the 1970s and it's going to happen next week. So I'll see you next time. And you know what? While you're, while you're waiting, why don't you go play with some Kalabi manifolds?